is it that makes a painter? That makes a painter? Yeah. Oh, some sort of sickness. Hello, fellow bad art critics. The year is 1901. Your father was at one point the strongest man in the Ottoman Empire, a Grand Vizier second in command only to the Sultan himself. You are the biggest, most well-known painter in the country. Time to unveil your next painting. No pressure, just try not to make a feminist, anti-religious piece that threatens your entire legacy. Oh no. Hotline Miami is a perfect game with a simple premise. Enter a level, kill everyone, leave. We could talk for hours about the story, the gunplay, the controls, but to me, Hotline Miami is... It's that undescribable rush, it's the neon combo counter after every shot, it's the pregnant woman sitting on the lectern where the Quran is supposed to be placed. Sacred texts are scattered across her feet, she sits above religion itself like a queen on her throne. Genesis by Osman Hamdi Bey is a perfect painting. Yet Turks call the painting Mihrab. Why? Mihrab is the wall behind her, it vaguely points towards Mecca, and the woman faces away from it, away from Islam. Osman Hamdi risked his life painting Genesis, but his father's legacy and his own position as a respected painter thankfully helped him get away with it. The painting, as you may have guessed, is nowhere to be found, lost forever. Lost in the World by Kanye West is not perfect. In fact, there is not a single perfect song on My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. Kanye could not make the album he wanted to make. He knew he needed a strong comeback album, so he made something that everyone would like that was palatable to every demographic. He watered himself down and did not make the experimental album of his dreams. Hell, here's him admitting to it. Dark Fantasy is me going back and spending six, you know, months, six dedicated months and kind of piecing together what people liked about me mm. to make an entire bouquet that they loved, that was the most listenable, that was the least challenging. Jesus and 808s are so much better and stronger. Of course I like Twisted Fantasy more than Jesus. I know, shocking take, but by my ridiculous metric of intent, it's worse. Though I realize saying something like, on site, is better than runaway, sounds absurd. Anyways, on site is better than runaway. Speaking of music, Hotline Miami has an incredibly diverse soundtrack. Sometimes it's Sometimes it's like And then it goes into I mean not just the music but the sound effects too when you pick up anything a gun cocks when you pick up a mask it does the funny sound this is a game where you go through a mountain of bodies and then you get to eat pizza for me it's that silent moment it's that still life with drinking horn lobster and glasses by Willem Kalf a perfect painting let me do my best art deco impression on the left of the painting there is a drink Morris play the drink sound effect under the table, there is a wooden child sculpture. Morris, you have to play the child sound effect. God! <laughs> uh, behind the drinking horn, you'll see an unlit candle. Oh, Morris, if you keep fucking up, you are not getting paid this month. All jokes aside, this painting is really not that deep. The lobster isn't some metaphor for consumerism. It's just a prongstilleven. <sighs> First try. An ornate still life. This is a niche art movement that Kalf dominates. His only intent is to paint as beautiful of a scene as he can, and in this one, he has succeeded fully. The centerpiece lobster is pretty much Kalf showing off his years of refined skill. Though the lobster also happens to be the name of a perfect film. The premise of the lobster is simple. 
Those who can't find love are sent to a hotel. If they can't find love there in 45 days, they get turned into animals. The message is clear. Those who can't get a partner are ostracized by society and eventually treated like animals. Single people are seen as weird and lesser outcasts. In the film, people who don't conform to this system of love live in forests and are just as radicalized as the people who run the hotel. One could say they are even worse. The picture is so anti-romance, so anti-love. Here, people change who they are just to get a partner, betray their friends for a shot at love. There is no scene of a romantic self-sacrifice. Instead, people choose their own lives over their wives with two, two apple, apple pies, pies and a and small, small fries. Fry. This is the type of film that'll make your parents get a divorce. The ultimate non-couples movie. So lonely, so silent, like how when you finish a level, the music cuts to just... You have to walk all the way back to your car. After all the carnage, all the destruction, there is a moment of clarity. It is during that return, that pause, that Sisyphus interests me. A face, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's a nice moment, but it's also 1874, and the Impressionists have just opened their first exhibition. There are no perfect paintings in the exhibit. I mean, how could there be? These are just prototypes for the masterpieces that are going to be created later. But one exhibition did inspire an article that is perfect. No, not the one that gave the Impressionists their name, but a far, far more humorous critique. This one article made me fall in love with art history. Here it is. De Rue Le Pelletier is a road of disasters. After the fire at the opera, there is now yet another disaster there. An exhibition has just been opened at Durand Ruel, which allegedly contains paintings. I enter and my horrified eyes behold something terrible. Five or six lunatics, among them a woman, have joined together and exhibited their works. I have seen people rock with laughter in front of these pictures, but my heart bled when I saw them. These would-be artists call themselves revolutionaries, impressionists. They take a piece of canvas, color and brush, dub a few patches of paint on it at random, and sign the whole thing with their name. The last sentence of the article is the most important. How many times have you heard the same thing said about contemporary art? It's just a few paint strokes and patches of color painted at random. The only thing missing is a throwaway line about how the writer could have painted it himself. They wrote this in 1876. It's been 147 years and traditionalists are still talking about the same shit. Hey, just for you guys, Slave Auction by Basquiat is a perfect painting. Okay, hear me out, please. It's actually a very simple painting. On the right, there's the sea and there are numerous slave ships represented as brown paper. How are they slave ships, you might ask? Let me explain with a story. One day, I was painting the walls of an elementary school. This is real, by the way. A kid comes up to me and says, Sir, can I paint too? Now I'm not getting paid enough for this shit, so I just give him a brush with red paint and let him loose. A couple of minutes pass and I check up on him, and he has painted a red cube. I ask him, what is that? And he's like, it's Spider-Man, and he runs away giggling. It was just a red square. It's hard to explain, but for him, it was Spider-Man. And for Basquiat, these are slave boats. This is a big mean scary slaver. You can't look at it through the lens of high art. You have to observe it like a toddler. Drop the critic attitude and just have fun. You know, Picasso went on and on about how he wanted to paint like a kid. We all know the famous quote. It took me four years to paint like Raphael, but one bajillion to paint like a child. Something like that. But let's be honest, no kid paints like this. Basquiat is way better at imitating a child. There are random doodles off to the side, there's a splash of color that always magically appears when children paint. It's so joyful, it's so real, it's a slave auction. Just on the aesthetic level, Hotline Miami is wholly unique. Like watching a VHS tape, the pixels constantly move. I adore the parallax on the transition screens, the gradient on the backdrop, the power-up that makes the game French that's real, the constantly mismatched color palette. Based on looks alone, this game is... This is a confidential audio recording for the Solar Sands channel. It better not end up anywhere else. Especially not in the hands of that polyblank guy. Ahem, <clears throat> anyway. Giorgio de Chirico's The Anxious Journey was painted in 1913, just before the start of the First World War. The first thing that I notice, that most people notice, is the train. 
It seems like it's coming straight for us, like at any moment it will crash through the brick wall and start barreling towards us like a rabid dog. The smoke is billowing out of it. From this perspective, it seems there really isn't any room for it to slow down. At least, that's what I see in it, because we don't have all the information. The brick wall obscures whether it's entering a station, or whether the track curves, or whether it's going to quickly run out of track and crash. The next thing we see are these numerous archways. Most seem to lead nowhere. I went to one of those Hall of Mirrors mazes once, and I was surprised by just how thoroughly my sense of sight became useless once inside. For the most part, I had to feel my way out. There were many dozens of false pathways, but also false ends. This work encapsulates that feeling of disorientation. The geometry of these paths and archways simply makes no sense. Nearly every archway either leads to darkness, possibly to more paths, or to this threatening train, or to this tiny sliver of daylight. But is that a false end? Are these all false paths? Is the train my only way out? I don't want to let the title guide interpretation too much, but certainly we are on some sort of journey, and we have come upon an obstacle. But the nature of this obstacle eludes us. These arches are a motif in other works by De Chirico. In fact, they're in nearly every painting of his that contains architecture. It's like he took his favorite thing and went control V several times. There are lots of objects that are repeated in his metaphysical paintings. The late afternoon sun that consistently casts long shadows adds nostalgia and atmosphere. It's as if all his works exist in a world where time stands still. We can only see bits of it in this painting, along with that emerald sky, which really pops out when surrounded by so much gray. The train behind the bricks can also be frequently seen in other works, like to the side in the distance, up close, and with other rail cars. This work is set apart from everything else in that it is strangely claustrophobic. But in this wacky world filled with steep angles and nonsensical architecture, who knows where these paths lead? This work is an exploration of the mind, as well as an exploration of physical space. All I am left wondering is what on earth is the deal with this train? Giorgio de Chirico achieves exactly what I think he set out. He knew this framing would make the train look dangerous. He knew which information to obscure. He knew what the rest of the scene should be to make this nostalgic yet ominous combination that can't be described in words. He has masterfully crafted another puzzle to place in his surreal world. Is he... is he gone? Okay, Cobblestone Bridge by Thomas Kincaid is a perfect painting. Peak Cottagecore. Look, Kincaid gets hate for three simple reasons. One, he's repetitive. Really? Monet paints a thousand lily pads, Morandi makes pretty much the same drawing hundreds of times and no one is calling them out. Two, he was a bad person. Oh, of course, Kincaid is the first ever painter to do something bad. Before him, all painters were great people and all saved one puppy each from house fires. Three, and this is the most used argument, is that his art is meaningless slop soulless product. People don't want to understand Kincaid. It's not like he couldn't paint other things like humans. He actively wanted to paint pretty cottages and he was damn good at it. He reached his intent to a T. I say, let the guy draw his cottages. And why does art need to have some grand big meaning behind it? Sometimes we paint things for the sake of painting because meaning is meaningless to me. I do not care for symbolism and I paint what I paint without meditating on a story. This one painting by Beksinski is perfect. Sometimes it's referred to as cathedral, but like most of his work, it's left untitled to hone in the message that there really is no meaning in his art. And it's actually untitled, not titled untitled like some contemporary snobs do. You know who you are, and I'm coming for you. Beksinski's art is simply beautiful sprite work. The animations, the tiles, the loading text, the giant floating heads when someone speaks. Hotline Miami holds no punches when it comes to its art. Except for the rotating dogs, bro. What were they thinking? 
Maybe it's just me? Or maybe it's 1744 and Tiepolo has just finished his next painting. The Banque of Cleopatra is not perfect. Not even close. This was supposed to be a retelling of a historical moment except it's needlessly cluttered with eye candy, bright colored figures and out of place still lives. Cleopatra is pushed to the background but she's supposed to be the centerpiece. Years pass and a wealthy family stumble upon the artwork. They love it, so much so that they commissioned Tiepolo to make another version for their palace's ballroom. And this time, he knocks it out of the park. Because pixel artists don't paint. I mean, how could they? It's such a restrictive style. Most people make tiny but effective sprites or bigger scenes. Of course, there are those who attempt to paint, but they usually use such a big canvas that the charm of pixel art is lost and the painting ends up looking more like a blurry illustration. So all in all, Pixel artists don't paint, unless you're him. Siangmu, or Siangmu, you know, let me just read his real name. Thomas, you know, let's just look at his art. 2020 is a perfect painting. This is to me Siangmu's masterpiece. He has done a few paintings since, but this one really pushes the art form to its limits, still keeping that pixel aesthetic while the surrealist forms shine through. You've most likely seen Siangmu's work before, he's everywhere, like the chest animation on Vampire Survivors. When you see good pixel art in a game, you know it's him. By the way, that part about pixel artists never painting was just to hype Thomas up. There are many, many fantastic pixel artists who do paint. Please support them. Also support Tiepolo's ballroom piece. Just look at this improvement. The Banque of Cleopatra Part 2, Back to the Hood, is a perfect painting. Finished 6 years after the first, Tiepolo finally gets to tell his story. Marcus Antonius invites Cleopatra to host a feast in her honor. Since nudity was seen as vulgar in Roman culture, in classic Cleopatra fashion, she shows up half naked. If this power move wasn't enough, she calls the banquet cheap and says that she could make a dish more expensive than anything she had eaten that day. She takes her expensive pearl earring, drops it into vinegar, and drinks it. I'm pretty sure she picked them later too. The painting and the legacy of Hotline Miami cannot be understated. So many games want to look like it, play like it, feel like it. Hell, this entire video tries to feel like it, but that's impossible. This is a one-of-a-kind, messed up, ultra-violent, neon, stylish game that you need to see and hear for yourself. It pains me to see such a masterpiece being so overlooked today, so insignificant and forgotten, as was Eugene Manet. Imagine being the brother of Edouard Manet, the husband of Bate Morisot, both mega star painters and deciding to be a painter yourself. The perfect painting this time is not by him. Eugene Manet by Edgar Degas is a heartbreaking painting. It looks more like a painting of grass than a painting of Eugene. There are no surviving works by Eugene Manet. We did not archive anything by Eugene Manet. Nobody cared about Eugene Manet, so now he lives in this painting. Forgotten legacy trapped in a field of grass. You know, Dega, you did pretty good for a pedophile this time. The password rap. The password rap. The p -p 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 password rap. It's our journey's end. Thank you for sticking through this very experimental video. Thank you to Solar Sands and to all the people who did fan art, to Ollie for the Discord server. Oh, and if you are still watching, why not subscribe? You lose nothing. Thanks again for tuning into Polyblank, and I'll see you later.